Welcome to the second webinar provided by Wisconsin Lutheran's Instructional Design Center. Today's topic is the personal learning environment brought to you by John Orlando and he will be discussing all of the different ways that students can learn and pursue their intellectual interests both inside and outside of the class involving their research, their knowledge, their personal lives, and condensing it all down to one area and he's going to showcase some of the technologies that are available to us now in order to do so and without further ado I would like to introduce John Orlando our presenter for the day he's spent the last 15 years teaching online courses and helping faculty migrate their courses to online environments John started the cyber summer program that brought online education to the University of Vermont and was instrumental in growing the Norwich University online graduate program from 43 to over 2,000 enrollments. John also created Norwich University's learning innovation team and has given more than 40 talks on learning innovation to university audiences. Welcome with me now, John Orlando and personal learning environments. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And today I'm going to talk about a new way of looking at education itself, really, and the use of technology in education. And that's the concept of a personal learning environment. And it's really an extension of the original use of online technology in education. And you'll see what I mean. It's a very exciting uh, use of technology, and it really extends learning beyond the classroom. And the way to explain it is to first talk about my son, Alex. This is Alex. Alex is a senior in college here at University of Vermont. And as a senior, you would think that uh, by looking at him, that basically he's just kind of moseying through his classes. He spends a lot of time video gaming in the summer. And he doesn't really have much in the way of academic interests other than to just basically pass his classes. But you'd be wrong. Alex is actually very interested in the intersection of religion and science. That is, he is very interested in a sci how science can actually study uh, religious beliefs. And actually, he does a lot of um, historical study of, of the development of religious beliefs. So he's very interested in the intersection of religion and science. Now, he feeds this interest by taking classes in religion and science. He's a religious studies and anthropology major, but he does a lot of outside those classes. He also engages in a lot of self-study. He's always reading books on different aspects of religion and science. He goes to talks that are given on campus. He watches documentaries. There's an interesting one um, called The Search for Jesus, uh, basically a, do a historical documentary about the uh, life of Jesus by Peter Jennings. And he talks about his interests. We sit at dinner, and, and he'll actually just kind of start talking about things like, did you, did you know that uh, Jesus is a recognized uh, prophet in the Islam faith? Uh, that in fact, most of the Jewish prophets are recognized prophets in the Islam faith. And he's talked about the reason why, because of in the intersection of certain religions and certain historical facts and things like that. He really gets them excited, and he even talks about with other, these are the rest of my family. So this is his interest. He's essentially created what we might call a personal learning environment around himself. That is, he has this central interest in his life, and he's feeding it through a variety of sources. Now, in some sense, that's not too unusual. I think in some sense, we all have a kind of personal learning environment. We all have certain interests. Um, I'm interested in uh, the use of social media and education, and, and I feed that by reading things by going documentaries, by doing presentations and things of that. You know, we all have certain types of books we buy. So we all have a kind of a certain uh, learning agenda. And for a college student or someone in higher education, the classroom is really just part of that learning agenda, or at least ideally it is. And I think for most people it is just a part of that learning agenda. But the way that uh, higher education has been historically formulated is to really focus on the classroom as the really the be-all and the end-all of that learning agenda. Education has traditionally been focused on uh, establishing a certain type of content that's created by a, a faculty member, a course content, 
and guides the student through that. In other words, it's sort of pushed from faculty member through student. Uh, same with the degree content. A degree is a, a series of steps that develops the student along a certain type of learning. It's faculty defined and it's consumption based. And higher edu or online education, I should say, is kind of followed that model. We, we put uh, courses online and by doing so we overcame barriers of space and time. But that, that model is still based around the classroom and, and essentially providing a certain predefined content to the student and then measuring them on their ability to understand the content. They understand 90% of it, they get a grade of 90%. 80%, they get a grade of 80%. The personal learning environment turns that around. The personal learning environment is a concept of developing an environment where students can feed that interest and start organizing all the various things that they do to feed their interests. Not only the classroom, which is obviously very, very important, but all the other things that they're also doing to feed that interest. So it's interest-centered. It's the idea is that the student has a certain interest and they're drawing together all those different things that, uh, that help them develop that interest. It's student-controlled because they're pulling in the material that, they've, that is relevant. It's also show social, and that's very, very important. And I'll talk a little bit about the technology, but central to this interest, if you're going to develop yourself, of course, is to engage in discussion with others. Now, in classroom, of course, we want discussion. I'm a faculty member. I always, you know, we all want our students to discuss. But, of course, there's a world outside the classroom. There's other students within the university or students outside the university. And with new educational, with new technology, not just educational, but new technology, they can, students can reach out across the globe and discuss their interests with people around the world. And it's creation focused in the sense that as students or as an individual, I should really say, is developing their interest in learning, they're creating more and more. They're creating their ideas. They're carrying their, their, um, they're building their knowledge base. So it's very much a kind of student-directed self-development. Now, there are a number of reasons why this development, I think, is very, very important. One, it's going to improve the learning income outcomes within the class just by, just by engaging in reflection. So my son, Alex, he takes classes, as I mentioned, anthropology and religion classes. Um, but he talks about things that are related to that class. He walks out of the class. He starts talking about that with us. We start coming up with thoughts. He starts thinking about other, you know, other things by discussing it with other people. He reflects on what he's learned in class, on what he's learned in class, and this helps him to, you know, engage and retain that content to really to make it real, and then to carry it um, beyond what he's been immediately given to sort of develop. Uh, papers and things like that. A recent paper, I think he examined, um, I think something about certain aspects of Jesus' life, um, early life, and how they might have influenced later thinking or something like that. And a lot of it had to do with some stuff he had discussed with us. So by carrying the, 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 the work in the classroom outside the classroom, you're producing a kind of reflection that's going to, in, that's going to create deeper learning. And there's a kind of an interesting um, uh, practice that used to be used, and it was called commonplace, and this is back in the 1700s in the Renaissance. Um, the great thinkers at the time used to actually carry around a paper notebook, and when they had a thought, they'd simply write it down in this notebook, and it could be that they've discussed an idea with somebody, and they wrote it down in this notebook. And it was very, very common, and the, the idea could be in any different field. I mean, if the, the the great thinkers, of course, of the, of the Renaissance, very often they, were, they had uh, ideas in many, many different fields that, you know, they weren't just restricted to one. But they would just keep writing these ideas in his notebooks. And this was important because they were preserving the thoughts that they had. And they were able to go back later and review these thoughts because very often they, maybe they, something struck them at one point. But then it, the reason why it was valuable only became apparent years down the line. So this, con this, this um, practice of commonplace and was critical to the advancement of knowledge. And what we're going to see is that the personal learning environment, what it does is it gives students a way of preserving what they've learned and carry it with them in a way that they can 
go back and take a look at that, uh, not only at the end of class, but months, years, and even after they graduate. And that's really very, very important for them as far as developing themselves as an individual. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a video right here. It's by a guy by the name of Seth Godin. Now, Seth Godin talks about blogging in this video. And what's really powerful is he makes the point that the mere fact that you are unwinding your thoughts in some kind of public for, uh, forum produces its own kind of learning. I might just, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to um, take the telephone and have to put it next to the speaker here and hopefully I won't blast you as I play this. And I'm hoping that the video will come through as well. So let's see what happens. How many of you have a blog? Hi. Blogging is free. It doesn't matter if anyone reads it. What matters is the humility that comes from writing it. What matters is the metacognition of thinking about what you're going to say. How do you explain yourself to the few employees or your cat or whoever is going to look at it? How do you force yourself to describe in three paragraphs why you did something? How do you respond out loud? If you're good at it, some people are going to read it. If you're not good at it and you stick with it, you'll get good at it. But this has become much bigger than Are You Boing Boing or The Huffington Post. This has become such a micro-publishing platform that basically you're doing it for yourself to force yourself to become part of the conversation even if it's just that big. And that posture change changes an enormous amount. I, I, I will simply say my first post was in August of 2004, no single thing in the last 15 years professionally has been more important to my life than blogging. It has changed my life, it has changed my perspective, it has changed my intellectual outlook, it's changed my emotional outlook, parentheses, and it's the best damn marketing tool by an order of magnitude I've ever had. And it's free. And it's free. So it's really Okay, so I hope you, I didn't blow you guys out or anything like that here. Return to the presentation. The point, let's see, back for just a second here. Whoops, it scrolled back up again, so I have to come back down here. The point of that is, is, is this. There's something like 200 million, even more blogs in the, in the world. And you're thinking, when you hear that, you think, well, it's just a concatenate of, 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 of voices, right? How do, you, how do you get through all that? to learn information. Well, what they're pointing out is that the primary value of blogging isn't necessarily to go out and find the information from others. The mere fact that you are unwinding your thoughts, that you are expressing maybe on a daily or weekly basis, here are my thoughts, that's a very, very powerful development tool. Blog, quite literally, is um, developed out of the ter term web log. The idea is it used to just be a, a log, like a diary. The idea was you literally took a diary and you put it online. Um, and it's powerful because you get comments from others. So that is true. I mean, if you, if you get followers, you get a lot of comments from others. But what they're pointing out here is really just, just having somebody on a daily, let's imagine a student on a daily or a weekly basis, simply re just think about what they've learned and just express that learning um, and again, they mentioned literally if it's just to their cat, that's, that's in itself a value. That's really what the personal learning environment is about. It's, it's synthesizing what you're learning, not just in class, but out of, outside of class and trying to put it together in a format that kind of makes it real to you. And finally, just building systems, we're going to see in a moment what these systems would look like, but building systems that allow students to publicly uh, talk about their interests is a very powerful uh, institutional name building um, uh, device for an institution. We know that a lot of institutions now are going into social media. They're starting to actually put their lectures online. Uh, iTunes U is the lectures that are online. I know uh, Open Stanford has a number of lectures online. MIT does. Um, all these universities put their lectures online. And if first thought is, why well, aren't they giving away their their institutional um, value, you know, their intellectual value. And the answer is, well, no, because one thing that you go to an institution 
off, uh, partly to, to be in the academic atmosphere. And of course, you're also getting the certification, the degree itself. By putting these, these lectures online, they're building their name. They're showing the world what they have to offer. So the fact that MIT has put their courses online publicly, not, not simply within an online course system, but quite literally free, that hasn't caused their enrollments to drop. It hasn't caused people to say, I don't have to go to MIT anymore, who would have gone otherwise. It's literally building their name. So the ability, so an institution that can literally get their students to start uh, expressing and thinking about what they're learning in class and engaging in students, uh, other universities as well, are, is building their institutional name. And many students, by the way, many high school students who are looking for a college, the first thing they do is they, they go online, they simply start looking for um, uh, what other students are saying about the college. Quite literally, word of mouth, word of mouth via social media um, is now a very, very, very powerful thing that motivates students to you know, choose a school, sort of what's it like, what's the inside information. So the more that you have student voices out there, the more you're building your name recognition. Now, let's get back to some of the tools that would be used to develop a kind of personal learning environment. Again, the idea is that instead of, um, to, to, we'll move beyond the individual courses uh, theory of student development to basically all the various elements that go into student development, coursework, as well as outside of courses. And I think number one is what we've just seen, the idea of blogging. And I'm just going to actually start by talking about blogging within a course um, and then get into how blogging can work outside of a, a course. The, the idea here, by the way, is also that um, these tools also move beyond the traditional what's called learning management system. And all universities that go online need a learning management system, be it Blackboard or Moodle or whatever. But these, system, these systems, and they're not meant to replace it, but they kind of go beyond it. And I'll give you an example of how you can integrate these into the classroom, and then they become the basis of creating a, a personal learning environment. So starting with blogging, um, there's a very interesting study of of, uh, of instructors who have used blogging in their classes. One was by John Wiley, who used his English class. And what he did is he simply had students blog their assignments. So instead of handing them to him, the traditional model in an English class, you write up a paper, you write to your professor, the professor is the only one who ever sees it, right? You get the paper back, you look at the grade, and then you, you know, forget about it. We like to think our students take a look at the comments and they think about the comments and they you know, make corrections, but you know, we know that, should know 98% of them just look at the grade and move on. Well, what he did is he had them first blog their paper, literally blog their assignment. Now, we noticed is that by putting it online, they first put more effort into it because now it's going to be seen by a lot of people and they want to make sure it looks pretty good. The second thing is that now they get feedback from each other, even instructors outside the class and even instructors from other universities and they're getting comments on simple grammar things, but also comments about content. All these comments are, used, are being used to improve their work. And then by the time they hand it in, the work has been improved quite a bit. And the way you put it is, there, other people start doing his job for him. All those little, that little you know, marginalia, the little comments about wrong version of there, you know, wrong grammar, you know, whatever. Other people were doing all that, that stuff that's no fun in, in grading. Um, for him. So he said literally other people are doing this job for him and the blogging improved the student work. So it improved it because it was public and because they're getting feedback. Uh, another example, University of Maryland, Baltimore County decided to introduce blogging into a chemistry course and the idea was that the students blog their lab results, I think in small groups, and then uh, each group commented on the other group's results. And they found that the average passing grade in the class uh, or passing rate, I'm sorry, rose from 71.2 to 85.6, which is interesting because you wouldn't, wouldn't initially think of a science course as something you would blog and you think of more kind of related to English. But again, the idea that you're making uh, your results public, you're having to unwind those, think about those, and get feedback from others, improved the uh, performance of students. So you can start by literally introducing this of blogging within a class, 
this is in our example I use, I teach medical ethics, and what we do is we go over uh, cases, some of these are real cases, some are hypothetical, and I put that up in a blogging format, and um, you see the case listed here, and then I have students comment on those. You don't see the comments because you'd have to expand it. So I started using that blogging format in my own uh, medical ethics class, and that's why we have a face-to-face -face class. So uh, it creates a kind of threaded discussion around the different cases. Now, to extend that, universities have started creating campus-wide blogging platforms, and all they're using is to put this regular technology, but they're basically making it available to all students and in a variety of different ways. Now, let's show you an example. This is a blog produced by um, University of uh, Mary Washington, and it uses uh, simple WordPress, I believe. WordPress is, is the format, is the system they're using here. But um, they're using it in a variety of different ways. And I'll give you some examples. Their students can create their own blogging page and their own pages, and they can use it to discuss the research. So here's a student who is doing research on, uh, I think she's doing research on China, and she calls it Panda uh, Musings. Um, and quite literally, she has stuff like the books she plans to read and the stuff she's thinking about. I think she's a graduate student. And she's simply blogging the kinds of things that she's running across as she's going through her classes. So this is causing her to sort of integrate the stuff from different classes and stuff she's researching outside of her class as well. This is that sort of bringing together that integration function that you, that you see. Another example. Uh, I went, by the way, when I was a junior in college, I studied in, in Rome for a year in 86, 87. And one of the things you notice when you're overseas, of course, is that uh, things are very different. And the other thing we remember when I was overseas, we all looked forward to letters from home because we all really wanted to, you know, get news from home, um, something about just being away from home. Well, uh, this university has this uh, blogging system so that the students that go overseas uh, are given blogs and they're asked to actually blog about their experiences so that they can think about, well, how are things different? And here's an example, and this is just sort of starting, getting people started. You know, he's, this person is in Australia and he starts talking about the different words. You know, people use this for, you know, air con means air conditioning, bogan, I guess, means trashy or something like that. And that's just an example. And, you know, that's one of the things you notice when you're overseas, you know, people use words differently. But then that's going to be the starting point. And then you've got to notice other things along the way. So I would, if it was me, I would uh, definitely have all students who are doing um, study overseas or study abroad definitely have a blog and start blogging their experiences because that's really an ideal way of synthesizing and thinking about your experiences. Uh, here's an example of a, a class blog. And I believe it might be, yes, it's around a, a class called Natural Hazards. And the faculty member um, puts up news reports, Avalanche in Washington State, and talks about it, and um, then students can comment as well. Also, here's an interesting thing they also do uh, use at the same college, student support blogs. This is actually the IT department or IT division. And they create a, a blog called Stuff for, Star Stuff for Starving Students. And all it is is um, recommendations on what you can, uh, where you can go to get free software. And there's a ton of free uh, software out there, by the way. And they're um, basically, if you, you, know, if you want uh, this type of thing, go here. If you want that type of thing, go, go somewhere else. So their IT department has created a blog, which is kind of interesting because most IT departments are just the way they're geared is just they have a help desk answering specific questions. But you have people working there who have a breadth of knowledge about all sorts of things. Nobody's bothered to try to, in most colleges, sort of capture that and put that out there. And all they did is they created this blog where the people in the IT department can just start posting you know, messages about systems they've run into and stuff they run into. And they're basically making this available to the students. Also, student portfolios. Uh, here's an example. This is all, by, by the way, at the same college again. Um, this is a woman who uh, I believe is uh, in 
some kind of web design or, or graphics major, and she creates a, a portfolio of her work on the blog. And we also have an example of student journals. Uh, this student journal is, I guess, it's, a, it's, it's an artistic journal. And the nice thing, by the way, I actually created an a academic journal years ago. If you create an ac academic journal using blogging software, which we did, the nice thing is that as soon as an article gets approved, it can be put up the next day. And, of course, people can reply to it immediately in the comments section, whereas in traditional academic journals, you know, it takes, seems like you get accepted and it's a year before it goes up. And then if someone wants to, you know, write a commentary on it, it's another three years before it goes up. But um, you can create student journals uh, using, this is, again, free blogging software where articles can go up immediately once they're approved. So that's one simple way of creating a, um, an environment that carries learning outside the class. A second example is the class wiki. This is a wiki that I've created with my um, Norwich University medical ethics class. It's not super elegant in design. You can see it's pretty basic. But the idea is that this is perfectly, you know, it's completely public. Um, I put a lot of the content for the class. You see a link to the syllabus, a link to uh, what the assignments are and things like that. But what I've also done is I've allowed students to start putting their own content. There's a, a you see there's a, a, a link to something called Just for Fun, and there are a bunch of videos in there. It turns out there's a lot of really funny videos that have been made by medical students around the country. Some of them actually teaching um, real medical principles and actually are being used now in medical school to teach principles. So someone sees an interesting video related to medicine, medical ethics, you know, they can put it in there. But you also see a link to topics. What I did is that each topic, each, each weekly topic, I've uh, created a page in there. I've asked uh, people when they see interesting articles to put um, those up there. So you see one, I think, about halfway through called Su Suicide Death, and it's an article that Sean Paz uh, found um, about England, uh, article about terminal sedation. These are articles that I can put up, but also students. Plus, I put my students in the groups, and what I have them do is I assign them each a topic that we've covered in class, and I assign them the job of creating course, literally content, teaching module related to that, that, uh, that topic. So in here, we have a student presentation on voluntary active euthanasia, and they're required to literally create content that would teach the topic to somebody who hasn't taken the course. And the student presentation Jeopardy, they have to come up with some kind of assessment module. Now, the nice thing about this is what they're quite literally doing is they're creating content that outlives them. They're literally going to be speaking to the next group of students. When you think about it, our traditional online courses aren't geared to do that. When the students are done in an online course, that content usually gets archived and the new course starts with a clean slate. So students don't really speak to the next generation. They don't speak across courses. But because this uh, wiki is trans course in some sense, you know, it continues across, across uh, different iter iterations of the course, then students are actually in some sense having a conversation with future students. Um, and they can go back there after they leave the course. I mean, most of them go into medicine as either nurses or doctors, and I don't, can't tell you how often or how many have gone back, but if they do have a question, they run into these ethical issues, and we certainly do the medical ethics course for our nurses and doctors because they will run into these ethical issues. Um, they could go back and they could you know, literally dig back into the course where they remember an article related to the issue and they can find it because it's all online. Um, we also created, oops, yes, um, we also created, when I was at Norwich University, our, what I call the learning innovation team, or we called it, um, this is just a group of people who were faculty members who wanted to basically explore new ways of learning, and we created a blog to do it, and we called it the Skunkers, and the Skunkers just was short for Skunk Works. Um, that was Lockheed Martin's uh, program where they uh, developed a number of important aircraft during World War II, and they did it by basically going, ignoring the traditional way of developing um, uh, uh, 
uh, new systems and new, new aircraft at, at the time, they basically said, we're just going to start experimenting. We're not going to be held back by administrative rules or anything like this. We're just going to start brain work, brainstorming experiment. And it's very, very po a lot of very, very powerful, very important aircraft came out of that. And the idea is this would be the same way, that anyone could start putting down content, anyone could start talking about the content, and it's all public. So you see that there are links to different technologies, resource repositories, learning and teaching methods. And here's an example, the link to blogs. Uh, this is actually taken a while ago. It's been developed quite a bit since then. But you have Harvard blog sites, you have examples, you have systems. If I scroll down further, you would have a bunch of articles about it um, and things like that. So when people see things that they, that they like, they just put it on there. They've saved it. They've curated it. So in essence, you have um, a page where there, while there are thousands of articles about blogs, when someone sees a good one that's related to what we're doing, they grab it. They save it. They put it on there. And everyone else can now see it. So it's a central repository to basically curate good information from a variety of sources. Whereas normally, people working by themselves, they may see a good article and you know they move on. You know. They may not even they may not even really save it in any format, but here it's now being all curated. And a third really powerful tool for building a personal learning environment is hosted bookmarking. Now this is something that interestingly a lot not a lot of people do. The idea is that um, most people when they find a page they like, they bookmark it on their favorites tab or or I guess I think that's what it's called on Microsoft Internet Explorer or the bookmark tag. And the problem is that that rapidly fills up to the point where it becomes unwieldy after you get like 100 bookmarks. Even if you put in a folder structure, it becomes unwieldy. So most people don't fill it up too, too quickly. Well, hosted bookmarking is basically cloud-based bookmarking. It was invented by Delicious, and that's what I still use today. And um, the idea is that you have a, a sidebar that gets integrated into your browser, and every time you run into a website you like, you simply save it, you tag it, and it gets saved in the cloud. So um, my bookmarks, instead of only being on whatever computer I happen to be using at the time, I can access my bookmarks from any computer in the world. So when I'm at my home computer, I save a bookmark. It's saved to the same space as the computer at work gets saved to. If I'm somewhere else, if I'm in a library somewhere else, I can quite literally save another bookmark to the exact same spot. And I have about 2,200 bookmarks. Anytime I find an, anything I like on the web, I just save it. Now, if it was in a um, regular bookmarking form, uh, that would be impossible to organize. But the power of the system is that it uses a tagging as a way of organizing. And what you see there is you see these tags, like Google, Google Wave. And the tag, as soon as you click the button Google, everything that you've um, logged with Google comes in below. It automatically fills below. So there are 48 different bookmarks with Google tag, and you see the 48 below. So that you can search your bookmarks the same way that you would search um, uh, like a, a Google search on the web. And just give you a quick example of how it works. You see a website you like, like this one is a, a class um, on actually on personal learning environments. All I do is I type tags that I've been using, education, technology, web 2.0, teaching, open education, PLE. I save it. And then later on, I can search those tags. So the content comes up very easily and quickly, whereas in a, a folder structure, the content if you don't know which folder you put in, you have to dig through, and you basically give up after a while. So what this allows me to do is basically save everything I run into. And what I tell people is that you can become an intellectual hoarder. You know, you see those, that there's a television show, I think, called Hoarders, where people hoard physical things, you know, they to build their house with physical things, and that's a problem. But I tell people that intellectually and hoarding is a, is a good thing. You can very simply hoard the kind of things you run into. So every time I see an article on a personal learning environment, I simply tag it with the PLE. And then I've probably got 30, 40 tags. And then a year later, two years later, I want to put together a presentation. I simply type PLE, 
everything I've run into related to personal uh, learning environment shows up. Or if I'm on Web 2.0, I just type Web 2.0. Every website I've ever run into that has something that I think is valuable on Web 2.0 will show up. You notice I write the notes. Why is it valuable? This is a course on open education run at this point. It's a good source for resources and discussion. So what it does is it, it allows me to curate around myself um, the, the valuable sources I've run into. Quite literally, it's a like uh, kind of commonplacing. And just another example here of the search, you simply type wiki. When I type wiki, I have 31 bookmarks show up, and then there are sub bookmarks. So if I know I'm looking for a wiki related to education, I say I click wiki, and then I scroll down in the education list, it'll sort by that. And it's very, very easy to quickly find stuff. And the other powerful um, use of this, and this is why it's being used in many courses, is it's social in the sense that when you bookmark a page, the fact that you bookmarked it gets saved in the system. Now, other people can't see your bookmarks, but the fact that you have bookmarked it gets saved. The reason why this is powerful is by searching the system for um, uh, tags, you can identify good sources of, in of information because these are sources that other people have saved. So I just did a sample search, free online music. Okay, I take free online music within the delicious system. The first one that comes up, the social music revolution, has 15,000 saves. The next one, Groove Shark, has 6,000. Well, 15,000 people think the first one is valuable. 6,000 think the second is valuable. Well, that's a, you know, that's a sign of approval. And I do a lot of my own searching by using this kind of system because it's like a vote of approval by, by other people. Um, you can actually create this around a class as well. You can create a uh, closed um, network where people who find uh, new bookmarks in a particular class, say an English class, you can say uh, everyone who is in a particular class, if you find a bookmark related to the topic in the class, put it into this, this uh, delicious account that we've created and everyone else in the class will have access to it, including people that come in, in the next class, and the class after, and the class after that. Uh, and when you leave the university, if this continues to interest you, you can go back and this will be curated. So again, you're, you're kind of in a, in a very, what's called crowdsourcing or a social way, you're curating content and gathering it up. Now, what I've been talking about so far of our individual systems that you can use to create a kind of personal learning environment around yourself. Um, a blog, uh, a wiki, and social bookmarking are all very powerful systems. Now universities can implement these systems on, a, say, a one-off basis, choose one or two or three, and that's one way of going about it, the, what I call the individual pieces route on the right. There are also some systems that are, <coughs> excuse me, more comprehensive, and they're more all-in-one systems. And these are kind of interesting because they're shells that attach to a learning management system, and they provide a real powerful way of extending the learning management system. I want to give you some examples here. One is called Going On, and I know it has an odd name. It was actually developed in collaboration at the University of Pennsylvania, and the idea is that when a student logs in to the system, they see both the content for an individual course, the top half here, Global Environmental Sustainability um, Collaborative, I guess it's called, the course, they get the content at the top, and I believe this, the system, learning management system they're using in this case, I think is Moodle. Even though it doesn't really have that Moodle look, I think they really redesigned it, but I think it's a Moodle system. But then underneath, they have blogs, chatter, which is <coughs> a basically kind of a community discussion, and that's a kind of um, personal learning environment shell that basically gets attached to all their classes and uh, allows them to integrate what they're learning in their classes. So I'll give you an example. Kind of next page is scrolling down. Here they have blogs either by themselves or others related to the classes that they're in, these student blogs. They have discussions related to the classes they're in, and other tools as well. So they can start talking about essentially what they learned in the class to people who are outside the class. 
maybe um, everyone in a particular major. So they'll start talking about um, uh, the topics and how it carries on to people um, uh, within the group in the, in the major. You can also, here's an example again of student groups, so students for environmental enterprise today. Um, you see a place where all students with a similar interest can gather, they can um, uh, post their own blog posts, they can curate interesting videos um, and the other interesting topics. So this all gives them a place to people of like-minded uh, nature to get together and discuss the topics. And then personal pages, you know what you notice is that these shelves, this particular case and others as well, they have a very Facebook-like feeling because that really Facebook revolutionized the way we communicate in the sense that there's something natural to Facebook and that it matches how we tend to think. Um, traditional software uh, really is built on the model of making the user think like a computer. Basically, it, it, it externalized the internal database of the computer. Facebook turned that around and brought the computer to the person. Um, think of the term Facebook. It's about faces first. That's how we think about people. The first thing we remember is a face. We don't remember you know, their, their, their phone number as easy as we remember a face. So it's that kind of thinking that these pages are built on the idea that they really match the way people think. And because they match the way people think, they're much easier to communicate those thoughts to one another. So individuals will have their own, you see this example of this personal page where they can start talking about what interests them. And here you have an example of blogging for a class. So a person creates a blog and it is uh, related to a particular class. So they can actually blog within a class or they can blog outside the class. And then another interesting, and I'm not trying to push this particular one, I'm just kind of examples of what's possible. Once they have this kind of shell, what they can do is they can take particularly good assignments that, that, they, that they produce and they can publish them. Uh, and again, it's, it's interesting that most of the content that students produce for classes, even if they produce something really good, they hand it in. The instructor is the only one who sees it. They may get an A on it. You know, they feel proud. But that's, that's the only person who ever sees it. Whereas you have the ability in these systems to create a, a process where a person can actually publish their best stuff and other people can see it and they can comment on it. Here's another example. It just happens to be a different product called Learning Objects. Um, similar feel. This is an example of what a student profile would look like. Um, they have different sections. Uh, my sites, they have their own resume, they have uh, tags, sites that are shared with me, uh, membership in different um, courses, different groups. So they've kind of brought together all their various things that uh, interest them from the different classes they're in to the different uh, um, clubs they're in to the different groups they're in. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to advance that. And um, a good one powerful use of this particular one I've seen is that a department can create um, a page for itself for all the faculty and the students or majors in the department can then visit and they start curating content, you know, stuff that they think is interesting related to the particular department, English department, physics department, whatever. So they be becomes a very much a community building um, platform for departments. And finally, this is just another software called ELGG. I forget what the acronym stands for. And this is open source. That's the only, uh, that's an advantage of it. I don't know a lot about, I know it's been used in Canada. Um, but uh, very simple to use uh, um, uh, platform. So to bring this together, the personal learning environment, the point of the personal learning environment is to basically get, get us to think of students as lifelong learners, or really that we're trying to create lifelong learners. As they're four or five, or you know, nowadays six years in school, is a, is a process of them learning and, and developing themselves and growing as an individual. But that should continue the rest of their life, obviously. I mean, they're going to go out there and they're going to still have these interests and they're going to be feeding these interests. They're going to have essentially a personal learning environment where they're going to be out there kind of uh, pursuing books and videos that interest them. And new software allows us to basically give them a system that they can organize that. They can preserve 
the kinds of things they run into with um, uh, social bookmarking, with wikis, with blogs. They can start talking to other people. Uh, and they can continue to develop themselves. So we want to think of basically the personal lear learning environment forces us to think of the classroom as only a starting point of a student's education and gives them the tool to basically make um, uh, uh, their education a starting point of basically a lifelong learning process. Um, so that's basically my, my, my uh, abbreviated discussion today. And, um, I'd be interested in hearing what what you guys have to uh, say about that. Um, John, I have one brief question, and that is, uh, what what management system are you familiar with, and do you believe helps um, promote the kind of learning that you are talking about here? Oh, you know, <laughs> interesting. I think literally starting as simple as a blogging platform, blogs are so powerful, something like WordPress, if, if that's what you're asking. But from a university standpoint, to quite literally do nothing more than to uh, set up a blogging platform where every student can have their own blog in WordPress. And because WordPress has added so many features to it, uh, more than just making um, discussion postings, but where they can post all different types of content and uh, talking to one another. I would th I think that this is just a very, very powerful way of getting started. Okay. Um, uh, beyond that, certainly a university that wants to uh, go for something more robust would, would look at something like going on. And of course, that's quite a bit more expensive. And you've got to um, train people how to use it. The advantage of, if you want to do something like an LMS add-on, one advantage is that you, you'd probably get e probably easier to get adoption among people who are already online students because what happens with the LMS add-on is they quite literally it, the the add-on is there while they're in the LMS, so it becomes sort of a natural extension of the LMS. Whereas if you get a student blog that's separate, it may take a little while for students to kind of warm up to the idea of visiting the blog. That's why actually if if a university created uh, or when a university creates a campus-wide blogging system, um, I encourage them to in have faculty adopt it within their classes in one way or another. So students forced to say do blogging related to their class, then they get used to it. Then they start seeing other people making comments, and um, then they just start kind of, uh, you know, it, it just snowballs from then there on. Okay, I th we only have one more question here, and that is. Um, are there any other technologies besides blogs and uh, social bookmarking that you think are high-ranking technologies to try and promote personal learning environment? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I really kind of grabbed the, the big three there, um, uh, wikis, blogs, and, and social bookmarking, because what I really like about them is they, they allow us to kind of save and curate information. So kind of thinking about a lot of the other stuff that, that I work with, my own page in, in the, um, or the Skunkers page on technology, it's got 40 or 50 different technologies, each for some different individual function, like digital storytelling, where people can produce stories in digital format, stuff like that. I Actually, the, the examples I gave you, I think, those are the big three because they allow you to uh, save and curate the content that you produce. There's a lot of technology out there, whether it be videos, uh, podcasting technology, um, image technology, um, other uh, uh, journaling technology that allow you to kind of create different pieces of content that can then be connected to a blog and stuff like that. Um, but as far as what you might think of as a personal learning environment, which is more of a kind of a, a comprehensive way of organizing your studies, I, when more I think about it and other people ask me a question, I just keep kind of go, going back to this idea of um, basically blogs, wikis, and, and uh, bookmarking. For instance, I, uh, just an example of, of, of the wiki, like the Skunkers Wiki is another um, example. Every time I run into a new article that I like, uh, related to um, uh, use of technology in education, I first save it on Delicious, and then I also um, 
put a put a little comment into my into the skunkers wiki as well. Um, I guess I'm doing twice as much work, but it's it's neat because I can um, cut and paste sections of what the page looks like on the wiki. I can um, uh, make my own comments, and that just becomes a really powerful powerful place for me to go if I'm doing a uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to do a webinar or something on digital storytelling. I just go to that digital storytelling part of the wiki where we have 20 or 30 different resources, articles, examples, stuff like that, and it's all there. I mean, it's literally, it's all there. I guess maybe the other thing I have now that now I got myself talking here a little bit, um, there are some interesting tools that are used for academic research. Um, that allow a student to essentially save a, a web page that they see uh, related to academic research. And it's very, it's very similar to social bookmarking, but it's a little more powerful because some of these tools will allow someone to go to a page and um, not only save the page, but uh, annotate it to some point, highlight different parts, and they actually some of the really powerful ones um, also, when you save the page, it'll go through and it'll grab bibliographical content from the page. It'll actually read stuff like the title, author, by looking at the actual source code. And the bibliographical content will fall into it so that now, let's imagine you save 30 different websites related to some, some topic you're researching, English Renaissance. When you write the report, when you cite that particular source, the, you can actually indicate I want a, a bibliography in APA format and it will build it for you because it will actually have understood the bibliographic content of the pages. So that can be used as a, as a good source too of, of basically uh, saving the content that you've run into and then you can go back to later. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. We all thank you very, very much for uh, a very invigorating and intellectual presentation. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future, and we will all have learned a great deal, and hopefully we can put a lot of this information to use as we move forward.